Okay. Okay. So welcome. So you can see, right, the title is uh, the Quantum CHSH game. And the image sources are from either Wikipedia or public domain, which means like the federal grant project. And here's the outline. First, I'm going to explain the uh, acronyms. You got some uh, terminologies in the title. Then I will uh, spend some time on the history of the game. Then I will back, I will back to the game. Then I will try to convince that I'm doing something important. So, okay, uh, this is um, a project supported by the collaboration among these three universities and these uh, agencies. Um, these universities pay the salary of the instructor. These three currently supporting the online infrastructure for the remote course. This agency is paying the salary of my mentor. And no, this one is paying the salary of my mentor, NSA. And NSA is like overwriting uh, the whole project. It's a remote project on the uh, cyber security stuff. And my work is on the theoretical side of the uh, cyber security. And the only classified thing in this project is the name of my mentor. Everything is, is uh, non classified. Okay, uh, so first, let's resolve the acronyms. Um, so the, when I say the quantum CHSH game, the CHSH means Clauser, Hornish, Moni, Hort, these are four people, all right? And so why we are calling it a game? So it's, uh, the definition is coming from the game theory thing. So you guys are familiar with this movie called The Beautiful Mind. Right, and it is about game. Uh, um, some aspects of game theory, which is Nash equilibrium, and so this de definition is borrowed from game theory. In a game, you have uh, several parties; they interact with each other. There are one or more referees; they conduct the game, uh, and there is one or more winning condition. So. Uh, the players know uh, uh, the winning condition to be satisfied to win the game. And there is something called winning strategy. So the, these are the techniques uh, at the discretion of the players. They uh, utilize them to win the game. And the referee or referees decide when it is a win or loss. Um, so who are the parties today? Some love song in the background. I don't like the picture. I look drunk. Wow. <laughs> I, I, I brought the ladies who were right next to you. So this is the referee. And why is it quantum? So you remember the four aspects of a game, uh, and the third one is the strategy. So in this game, the strategy is borrowed from quantum mechanics. So that's why it is a quantum game. And why is it CHSH game? Because that particular strategy was initially uh, imagined by these four people, Clauser, Paul, Shimoni, I forgot the other name. Oh. 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 Okay. So, let's, um, so, I'm done with this part. Let's now start the history of the game. So, this history is again divided into these steps. Uh, first, I'm going to explain the idea of determinism in quantum mechanics, then I will tell why Einstein was pissed off at them, and then I'll explain the EPR paradox, the einstein podolsky rosen paradox, then I will mention a little about the Belling inequality, then finally the CHSH inequality, which is the integral part of the CHSH game, the winning strategy of CHSH game. Uh, so, uh, so this is a story which developed from 1905 to 1930. So this for last these 25 years. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of uh, uh, 20th century, um, uh, uh, um, starting with Max Planck, then there was a whole bunch of mathematicians, physicists, and Philosophers, they uh, developed the foundation of quantum mechanics, right? And 
two people, Max Born and uh, Niels Bohr. This is the guy who is Niels Bohr, and his family now uh, uh, lives in Baltimore. So, so actually, his son was also a Nobel laureate, I guess. Yeah, and I think grandson is a professor of Hopkins. Okay, so this guy developed this idea that any quantum object, which means the smallest particle, we can detect, we can imagine, and we can actually theorize. So these are called quantum objects, and we use quantum mechanics to understand the smallest entities available in the nature. Or if, uh, actually, we can uh, imagine through all the mathematical machineries we have you know, at our discretion. So this said, any quantum object, or any smallest particle we can uh, imagine, is in the superposition of states. So what do you mean by states? Think about a large object, say, um, uh, he might have all kind of states. Like he, one of the states is the position of Partha, so which says Partha is right here. Another state might be like anger. He, right now he's cool. He's not angry. Uh, say for example, his state. He's now eating something. These are the states. So we describe. We use this information or quantity in some cases to describe uh, an object. So for quantum mechanics, for example, the particle which constructs light, the photon, we can say a photon is either, uh, uh, I mean, uh, you guys know, like, uh, so when we talk about light, we can imagine a scenario where particles are emitting towards us. We call them photons. This term was uh, coined by Einstein. And when we uh, study the theory of photons, we uh, know that there is a quantity associated with photon, we call it polarization. So any photon is associated with an electromagnetic field around it, and the, uh, yeah, the, the orientation of the electric field uh, uh, could be in different states. And for, say, we pick only one of them, which is the polarization for either a photon could be vertical or horizontally polarized. So these are the things. They define that uh, any quantum object might be superposition of states. So we know that states are kind of information about an object. So what is superposition? Superposition means a, an object could be in two different states at, uh, at the same time. For example, we're saying if uh, Partha is in a superposition of coolness and anger, we can say that he is both uh, cool and angry at the same time. So it's not very natural in real life object, but at quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, it is very common. So a photon is, is it sort of superposition of wave equation sort of yeah. So. Uh, so uh, for photons, we can imagine that a photon could be in both uh, vertical and horizontal polarization. These are called superposition. Um, I'm not going into details of that. Uh, as long as you believe in this guy, it's okay. And any given time, when you really want to measure the quantity, it collapses into one of these two states. So for example, in a, this is a so think about it is a laboratory, and I'm shooting one photon at a time towards you. So I'm, I'm preparing it in a uh, uh, way that it is both horizontal and vertically polarized at the same time. But when you measure it at your end of the lab, you, are get, you will get either horizontal or vertical polarization, not both at the same time. Although, yes. Why is like uh, YT or TM only? Like, are you using a polarizer in between or something? Uh, when I say he's measuring, he's actually using a polarizer. Okay. So that his question sense. is, yes, go ahead. Oh. So he asked um, uh, uh, whether I'm using a polarizer. Polarizer is kind of device. So uh, when someone measures a photon, he actually uses this polarizer. It's kind of a transparent sheet. Or think about your sunglass, which can polarize. So if, when a photon goes through the sheet, it collapses at this point. It collapses into one of the states. Like uh, that's the sunglass is a polarizer, you can say. So uh, these are the assumptions of, of quantum mechanics. Uh, so that uh, a quantum object could be in two uh, states at the same time, uh, and uh, when you uh, measure it, it call takes only one of them. And so, uh, and how 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 a photon decides uh, where uh, or in which state it would be when someone measures it? So that was the question. And Niels Bohr and other his friends said it happens at random, and this is what uh, made. Einstein crazy. He says, no, 
I mean, when they discuss quantum mechanics, people are, uh, scientists are actually explaining how the world works, right? At the most uh, granular level. But Einstein said, how come we live in a world which is random? So in a lab, a photon is coming towards you, you measure it, and it randomly is either in vertical or horizontal shape that made an increase. How come it is random? I mean, we see a very orderly world, we can predict what is going on, then how come at the fundamental level it is random? But Niels Bohr said it is. It is way, the way it is. And since said, no, I don't agree. So they had like a series of um, conference and counter, uh, I mean, talks and counter talks in the same conference. Uh, this is called Solovia Conference, which uh, took place in Copenhagen. No, not Copenhagen, not this in Solovia, but somehow Copenhagen is related, whatever. So, so uh, they have this, like, uh, I think, decade-long debate, and uh, they opposed each other, uh, that no, I mean, randomness or indeterminism can be a part of our reality, because we, everything is so much organized, so much predictable. How come it is random? The world is random. So I understand was uh, really pissed off. And so then uh, came 1935. This is the year uh, in which the most downloaded paper in the history of scholarship, human scholarship, actually written. It was written by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. And this is the paper, uh, uh, I mean, which is most downloaded from any uh, article or journal repository in, the, in any, across any discipline. It is called, and the funny thing is that the content of the, um, article was later proven to be wrong, unfortunately. But it is one of the most fundamental uh, uh, product, uh, I mean, uh, scholarship of Einstein and his colleagues. So they actually imagined a scenario. So think about this as a source of uh, pair photon. So what do, what do they do? You can always interrupt me and ask questions, sorry. So they, they, have, they have some device, which is called SPDC. I, I mean, you can gener generate pair of electrons or pair of photons in many ways. But the most famous one was actually invented by a professor in the physics department at UMBC. His name is Yang Huashi. I'm using his idea. But back in Einstein's days, he was using other techniques to uh, um, uh, produce conjugate pairs of particles. It could be pairs of electrons, it could be pairs of, I'm sorry, it could be pairs of electron and positron, or it could be pairs of photons in opposite uh, polarization. So whatever particle you generate, you generate the pair of particles in a way, in a quantum mechanical way, that they are uh, complementary to each other. If the charge of one particle is positive, another one will have a negative charge. Uh, if the uh, polarization of a particle is horizontal, the other will be in uh, uh, vertical polarization, and it comes from the law of the conservation of uh, energy and momentum. So the sum of the total um, polarization or the sum of the total um, uh, charge will be constant and might be zero. Right? That's uh, the uh, uh, law of the conservation of energy and momentum is related here. So two particles go to each uh, one at Parthas and one in, in Lepjes and, and we call them entangled because uh, they, uh, because of the uh, con law of the conservation, uh, the total uh, um, value of the uh, some particular set of quantity will be always um, constant. So, so for example, for electrons, Partho measures the uh, uh, Partho measures the uh, charge, uh, uh, spin of the electron, spin means the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the, uh, the quantity of fundamental particle. Think about a quantity which could be either minus up or plus up. That's it. You don't care about how they measure it. So if Partho measures the spin of the electron at his end as plus half, he's sure that because of the conservation of energy, the other electron, which was created at the same time, in the middle, so the other electron and you know, just and 
is will be the spin of the other integer will be uh, my, the plus half if that is minus half. They move towards each uh, 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 I mean to the opposite of each other because uh, the moment the total momentum has to be uh, uh, constant. So if one electron goes this way, the electron has to go the other way because of the momentum, right? And total charge has to be zero if you start with a neutral atom. So there, so uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, total angular momentum. So the spin, if the spin is here plus half, uh, quantum mechanics says that the other spin will be minus half. So Partho can actually predict without any help from anyone that the uh, uh, what, uh, the spin is minus half. See if it is plus half here. And Partho knows the position or the speed or momentum of the electron, right? So with that information, he can actually predict the spin and the momentum of the other electron at Pilovja's end, which violates the uncertainty principle. Yes, go ahead. Are they in the same condition, under the same condition? What condition? Like if the magnetic field is different, E2, in that case, Partho will not be able to predict that. Say it again. If the magnetic field, like B, is different in E2, like if the surrounding conditions are different, those, those two electrons are carrying oh, the, the same The assumption form. is that they are in vacuum. They are just, uh, oh, they're all, in the, vacuum? All, all the fields okay. are set with the electron themselves. There is no other surrounding. Okay. It is like very um, ideal case. Okay. Yeah? But what you're saying, uh, even if you um, uh, consider external fields, you can actually calculate that it is uh, entangled and complementary. But in that case, the fidelity will be a little different. But, I mean, uh, eventually, it will again satisfy the law of conservation. Yeah, but if you, like, you are using conservation of angular momentum, right? Yeah. But Which means <coughs> energy. Yeah. But if there is magnetic field, then the equation is to disturb. Here in one end, so no. In, in that case, in that case, the conditions will also change. Yeah, I mean, the prediction will not be the change. opposite. No, not exactly. Opposite time something. No. Right. Yes. I mean, standard vector calculation. Yeah. So, uh, so which means Partho can know the information at this end in no time, and uh, so which violates the first postulate of uh, special relativity, and another thing is that Partho knows uh, the. Uh, information, both the spin and the momentum of you know, this information at the same time, which violates the uncertainty law by his input. So, so he, this was a result of in Einstein's paper, and he claimed that uh, as uh, so this result violates the foundation of, uh, of quantum mechanics. All right. So Einstein's paradox survived for around 30 years, and in late uh, 60s. John Stuart Bell, this guy, actually devised another experiment and showed that uh, quantum mechanics predicts uh, in the right way. And he actually uh, uh, figured out a, 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 a realizable experimental setup. And so where a source is emitting two electrons in two ways, and these two guys measures them in different setups for spin uh, say, for example, um, for the spin, it me measures the spin for different angles. All right? So, uh, and he ca came up with an algebraic relation, which is called the Bell inequality. So it says, uh, I, 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 I mean, sorry for bombarding the equations. I mean, you don't have to follow everything. You just, I'm saying, A means uh, Partho is measuring uh, the spin at certain angle. Uh, C means, so the first item is part, uh, related to Partho, the second item is related to Nilabjo. So for every pair, like real life, Partho, Nilabjo, Partho, Nilabjo, Partho, Nilabjo. And A means Partho is measuring at A angle, C means Nilabjo is measuring at C angle. So Partho at B angle, Nilabjo at A angle, Partho at B angle, Nilabjo at C angle. And, and in a realizable experiment, when you, and this means the coincidence, which means, um, they are measuring the device at two different places. They are not kind of communicating. And when Partho measures at A angle and Nilabjo measures at C angle, both of them are getting the same spin. Then the value of rho is 1. Yes. Uh, is this is a correlation. Correlation, correlation. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, the, uh, uh, 
according to uh, Bell's theorem, um, if quantum mechanics is not true, if Einstein is uh, correct, quantum mechanics is not working, quantum mechanics can't explain the real world, this will be satisfied, which means the correlation, if you take the algebraic sum of the correlation, it will always be less than one, less than or equals to one. That was his idea. And he, he never did it in, in the lab, but he proposed a realizable experiment, and, which, uh, uh, and if someone follows his instruction, he will be able to test this equation, inequality, and if it is greater than one, he will, uh, someone can, uh, uh, could decide that, okay, quantum mechanics is correct. If it never, uh, uh, it is never greater than, uh, uh, equal to or greater than one, someone could decide that quantum mechanics might not uh, be the best idea to explain the real world. So, so it's all possible combinations? No, not necessarily. There are like only, only uh, say AC, you're not taking AA, see? Mm -hmm. So AN is not considered. Uh, BB is not considered. Okay. If you consider A and BB, you could actually uh, uh, think about other inequalities. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is, uh, 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 I mean, it could be shown that this inequality is necessary and sufficient uh, to decide the uh, 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 feasibility of quantum mechanics. But it is true that if you take other combinations, it can also uh, be used for an another experiment, and that can also have some important information. But uh, yes. A was the angle one end, C was other end, right? Yeah. And B was? Uh... B was when, uh, so Partho is now doing another round of experiment okay. with another angle. Okay. You are doing another, uh, this, in the same round, you are doing with another angle. Okay. So in the third round, Partho is now ch uh, uh, choosing B to measure the spin, and you are choosing C to measure the spin. So it's like several rounds of experiment, the same experiment. Okay. All right? So in quantum mechanics, you never do measure only once. You always or do this, or, or like thousands of <coughs> time and you take the average, or expected yes? Okay. okay, so what you said is like, uh, it is about testing the uh, viability of quantum mechanics, so anything like this is sufficient. Right. Uh, there should be absolute value like that, so the maximum value is minus, near value is minus one to plus one. But then, so uh, okay, okay. So yes, yes, I understand. Uh, Bell, uh, uh, I mean, here the focus is about the maximum. Bell. This is the maximum. Bell. It could be at best one. I mean, it's absolute of this thing, right? Or just no, actually, in real, in, in Bell's paper, you will see something here too. That's what Perth is talking and about. Min negative minus one to one, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but right. <clears throat> so yeah, so in summary, Bell actually. They proposed an experiment to uh, verify the uh, correctness of quantum mechanics. So, previously I was talking about Bell inequality, right? You see the change in the title, CHSH inequality. This was derived from Bell inequality. And it's like, uh, I added this picture um, I liked in the like, 11th hour because um, when I was uh, in, uh, in the conference, the QIP conference uh, last time, so people decided that uh, this is a guy uh, who is one of the, uh, the founders of quantum information, but he is like an unsung hero. So and he never received any award. So people in the conference decided they will somehow uh, put his name or picture in uh, any related talks, just to uh, uh, um, let other people know that this guy is important. His name is Boris Sirelson. I think he is still in Romania, yeah, he teaches in Romania. So, uh, from, Bell was, Bell, the formula Bell derived was related to the, the best performance of a classical system, which means when quantum mechanics is wrong, right? So, Sirelson take it into the, uh, to the next step. So, he, uh, he used the idea of uh, algebraic geometry uh, uh, to, uh, uh, derive the equation for quantum systems. So assumption, the assumption is that quantum mechanics is correct. Then he came up with another formula or another inequality and said that this is the best performance if quantum mechanics is uh, best performance of Barton Lovejoy if quantum mechanics is true. Previously, um, yeah. this is the best performance of Barton Lovejoy. There's one if quantum mechanics is. Uh, 
are not correct. So Sridharsan used his geometric tools to uh, find the best performance for if quantum mechanics is true. And since then, all the uh, because quantum mechanics is true, uh, or, or every further research base is based on Sridharsan's result. Yes, and one of those further research was the uh, result by CHSH inequality. So previously you saw A, B, and C. It's like three different measurements. You can see you now four different measurements. A, B, and A prime and B prime. So like four different settings. So now, Partho Nilabja, Partho Nilabja, Partho Nilabja, Partho Nilabja. Partho is measuring at A angle, Nilabja is measuring at B angle. So this is another experiment. And for this experiment, even if quantum mechanics is true, they can't go better more than two. And any classical system cannot be more than one. So there is, this is the window. So in your lab, you, if you get something between one and two, you actually experimentally proved that quantum mechanics is correct. Which means our real world is quantum, and if we, uh, we, uh, so when we say our real life is quantum, we actually recognize the assumptions that this is non-deterministic and random. So if anything we see in this world is orderly and deterministic, maybe because of the weakness of our mathematical tool or understanding we are missing something, or uh, somehow our understanding of the world is fundamentally different. Of the so. I'm, I'm not uh, uh, deriving how he uh, derived, uh, uh, I mean, came up with this inequality, but it's not very difficult. Like, um, it, it is, uh, these are all the correlation functions if you derive, uh, think from the perspective of quantum optics. Or if you just, uh, okay, for a high, high school student, I could, I could say that these are like um, detection in the device. So. In, real, in, in the laboratory, you will see the sound like click so when you measure the photons. So this means with Partho measuring at A angle and Hilakjo measuring at B angle, both of them sound here is click. Here, with Partho measuring at A angle, Hilakjo measuring at B angle, both of them are hearing this. All right, this click. So the total number of clicks. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the, uh, the uh, number of clicks after satisfying this relation can be more than two, even if quantum magnitude is true. These are the, like, the results. So, um, why it cannot be greater than two? If uh, the last one, P, A prime, B prime, rho A prime, B prime, is zero, if it's zero, and other thing, A to one, you said this is zero, but I think it cannot be because these are correlated, these are correlated, this has to be something correlated. I mean, if A is correlated to B prime and A, a prime is correlated to B, B, and A prime and B prime cannot be uncorrelated. Then this correlation comes if, from if because one one, then it has to be sort the, of one. The quantities at both ends are complementary because these are entangled photons or entangled electrons. So whenever you measure something uh, at one end, the other, the quantity at the other end will be a complementary quantity of that. This is this comes from quantum mechanics. And there is nothing uh, equivalent to this in classical um, uh, mechanics or classical physics. It's, these are not independent. The choice of measurement is independent, but the quantity you are measuring are not independent. But what is the difference then? What is the difference between classical and quantum? Uh, like, so this is that. This should be true for classical also. No. Because uh, there might be cases where in classical. Two electrons could be both in minus half spin. If they are not entangled, if uh, because the assumption is that they are coming from <coughs> the same source and they uh, are generated through the, this process of um, uh, the cascaded system, and so yes. Sure. Uh, when they are uh, like when you are like measuring with respect to angle A, yeah. that means you are putting something in angle A and then measuring it. Uh, what angle the photon must be, right? Something like that. 